Well, good morning. Good morning. And, uh, let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, mighty God, awesome Saviour, speak to us now. Make us the church you want us to be. Pour out the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts, to change us, to be more like Christ. Father, bless this service, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, today I would like us to think over and think about God's love for us. In the time I have to talk this morning, I'm not even going to scratch the surface of the mountain that is God's love. But my hope is that if you are a non-believer, some myths or misconceptions you may have about God will be displaced. Or if you are a believer, you will be strengthened and encouraged more by the knowledge of God's love for you. Now I remember as a, as a child playing in school. Those days are starting to look a lot further away now. But sometimes there would be a group of girls sitting in a circle picking daisies. And one by one they'd start pulling the petals off, chanting, He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. Talking about their boyfriend or, or someone they had a crush on. And I think too often we can have this, uh, this mindset about our God and about God's love towards us, which is not a good mindset to have. Let's look at the text that was read out just a moment ago, focusing on verse 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. There's a lot about God doing things in these verses, and not a lot about us doing things. Let's break it down and have a closer look. For God. There's the first thing we need to look at. And the next thing, he gave. That's the second point. And then, in him. So in all these things, God is doing something. What do we need to do? Whoever believes. That's it. You're joking, right? If, if I just believe, I won't perish, but I will have eternal life. Well, well I'm in. I'm in. Count me in. But what am I believing in? That's what we are here to find out. I want us to see that God Almighty, the creator of the universe, the great I am, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the author of this Bible is a God of love. That he is love. That God is love. And that he only wants the best for all of us. And as a loving father, he has done all he can to show everyone this truth. We don't need to go through this life plucking at thin air, chanting, he loves me, he loves me not, he loves me, he loves me not. I want us to leave this place standing on the promises of God. I want us to build the house on a rock that is Christ Jesus. Amen? So let's go back and look at the three things God has done for us. So number one, for God. For God so loved the world. Oh, so God loves the world. So God's heart towards me and you is a heart of love. God has proved his love for the world, to the world. You cannot sit there today and say that the God of this universe does not love you. This doesn't mean that his anger and his wrath are not upon us today. What it does mean, though, is that his heart towards us is a heart of love. And he really must love us. 
Because the second point I want us to look at is he gave. What has he given? For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Why? Why would anyone give their son up? Especially the son of God? Well, there's a problem. That's why God had to send his son. What problem, you might ask? Now, this is one of those moments in life when you know you have to be honest. You, you know it's going to hurt, but you also know that you can't lie. Because, because if you lie, you've crossed a line that, that's hard to come back over from. So what's the problem that God had to send his only son to help with? Sin. What's that? Sin is any action, word or thought that is against God's will. Sin also describes the state of each human heart before God. Because our, because our heart is in rebellion against God, it doesn't care much for the things of God. The Bible says this about the human heart. Uh, the first one is Jeremiah 17, 17 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? In Matthew 5.22, Jesus says, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable of judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. In the same chapter, but verse 27, Jesus says, You have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. See, God sees the heart. God sees the true intention and motive behind every action we've ever done and we will have to give an account for all of them but just a mo imagine for a moment that your life every thought every action every reaction just everything you've ever done was going to be played on a cinema screen for the whole world to see how would you feel or just imagine your mum was going to see it now, now imagine that a perfect, pure, holy, loving, just, good person. You know, the person we all wish we could be sometimes. Imagine that person who's done nothing wrong was going to watch it. Now how would you feel? I know exactly how I would feel. I would feel dirty. I would feel wretched. I would feel unworthy. I would feel guilty and I certainly would feel ashamed. Why would I feel that way? Let's look back at the text which was read out for us at verses 19 and 20. And this is the judgment. The light of the world, the light has come into the world and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. The Bible is clear. The Bible is honest and true. We have a problem and that problem is deep inside our hearts. And we don't want to come to God lest our deeds be exposed for what they really are evil our lives are in complete rebellion against god and quite frankly we love it so in the eyes of god we are all sinners we've all done things wrong i don't care who you are <laughs> you could be the king or queen of timbuktu but still we have all done things which we are not proud of. We've all had that moment in life 
when our consciences have pricked us about doing something when we know we shouldn't have. But we've still done it anyway. That's the truth we have to acknowledge today. We are not perfect. And because we are talking about us sinning or, or doing wrong against a God who is holy, he is perfect, he is righteous, he is pure. And anything that is not pure cannot be found in his presence. And because he is perfect, righteous, holy, just, uh, just God, he must punish sin. He must be a righteous judge. He cannot let sin go unpunished. He can't just, just sweep it under the carpet and forget about it because that would not be loving, that would not be just. But as a side note, uh, we have a built-in desire to see justice done when someone has committed a crime. How many times when watching the TV or, or reading the newspaper or anything like that, when we read something about someone who has done something wrong, what we, we think that they've deserved that punishment or, or that they've been too lenient with that sentence. We like it when justice prevails because we know something wrong has to be righted and that a penalty has to be paid. This is a very interesting point. Where does this moral compass come from? This desire to see justice prevail. If we live in a dog-eat-dog -dog world, you know, survival of the fittest and all that, why are we so concerned about justice? Where does that come from? Anyway, back to point. God cannot let sin go unpunished. So his offer of eternal life is to save us from eternal punishment. Because sin is a barrier between us and himself which we cannot destroy. We cannot sort this problem out. So he sent his son to help. Which brings me to my third point. In him. We, sorry, what are we believing in when we believe in Jesus? Let's read 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. This fact or truth, because that's what it is, should literally blow our minds. It should, it should bring us to our knees in worship and cause us to be in awe of such an awesome God. God Almighty sent his son to be punished for all. For all. Full stop. End of. That's it. Jesus died for our sin. No one can save themselves. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have all missed the mark. We've all come up short. We cannot save ourselves. Look at society with all its, all its advancements in education and technology. Are people still shooting each other? Yes. Are there still wars? Yes. Have we changed? No. There's still a problem. And that problem is sin. And it has to be dealt with. It has to be punished. And God did not want to just leave us in our sin. So he sent his son for us. To stand in our place. So today, we can leave this place. Throw away our daisies and shout from the rooftops. He loves me, he loves me, he loves me, he loves me. Oh, how much he loves me. He has shown how much he loves me by sending his son to die for me. Now, I appreciate for some of you, this is not a new message and you may be tired of hearing it again and again. But you shouldn't because it is the gospel. And we should marvel at, this one, at the wonderful truths of it. 
over and over again. But for some of you, this may be the first time you've heard about it all. And it may sound a bit, a bit like mumbo jumbo. You, you, may, you may also think that we're a bit cuckoo. But I assure you, we are quite sane. And we would love to talk to you more about these wonderful things. So please do speak to someone and ask any questions that you have after the service. Or you may be sitting there relating to something that, that has been said. You, you know what we're talking about. Again, please don't go without talking to someone. Now we get to the, uh, to the more difficult bit. Personal application. How do I respond to God's love for me? For the non-believer here today, you have the easy bit. You can accept God's gift today and begin to let him work in your heart by the Holy Spirit to bring about change. We would call this repentance, which basically means a change of heart, uh, a change in direction, a, a turning away from the things which the Bible tells us are not good for us. It's like a U-turn. And it's very important to remember that this change is brought about by God. God says he will send a helper to help us. The Holy Spirit. He will do the works in our hearts to change us. This is the wonderful thing about God. He does it all. All we have to do is believe in our hearts and speak with our mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord and we will be saved. Or you can carry on by yourself. But the Bible says it doesn't end well. The reason it doesn't end well is because you, the non-believer, the one who doesn't trust God, the one who doesn't want to be with God, will be cast out from the presence of God, cast out of heaven to a place where God does not dwell, which is, yes, a place called hell. Do not be fooled. This is not a place where we, you will meet other people and discuss the reasons why you didn't make it into heaven while drinking and eating and doing all the things you were told not to do in this life. No, it is eternal punishment. It is eternal damnation. There is no good there. There is no joy there or happiness. There is no laughter. Jesus describes hell as a place of outer darkness, a place where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I'm not trying to scare you into salvation, but as an elder of this church, it is my duty to tell and to teach what the scriptures say, and the Bible clearly states that there are two camps. You are either for God or you are against God. There is no sitting on the fence. You have to make a decision. If you are in that boat, you have a little more time to think over what I've said. Because now I'm going to speak to the church, the body of Christ, his beloved, the one whom he was willing to die for, the ones that call on his name and confess him as their saviour. How do we respond to God's love. In the passage that was read out earlier, Jesus was explaining to Nicodemus how salvation was inclusive of all, which was always the plan. But so I believe the Lord is giving us a warning here today that we do not make the church an exclusive faith. That which it was never meant to be. That which the Pharisees and the religious leaders had made it. God's gift of free grace to us is precisely that. A free gift. Romans 2, 8-9 For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. None of us here 
who call on the name of Jesus as our Saviour, who accept God's free gift of salvation, are here because we deserve it. We cannot boast as though we have achieved anything or earned our salvation in any way. In fact, the Bible describes all people as enemies of God before the miracle of salvation. Look at Romans 5 verses 10 to 11. For while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Here we see God's heart. Here we see his love in action, reaching out to a lost people. We were all in the enemy camp before God came along and redeemed us with the blood of Christ. God saved us. We in no way saved ourselves. So how can we, as the church, as the body of Christ, respond to this love? We must replicate it in the way we respond to people coming to us. Our doors must not have a filter on. We mustn't be put off by people. Jesus wasn't put off by us, even when we were enemies of God. I think we all worry a bit too much about people sometimes. People disturbing what we like to happen in a service. Because I don't think Jesus was worried about it one bit. Look at Matthew 19 verses 13 to 15. Before we do, let's get a bit of a background of the story before we read the verses. It seems Jesus is is giving a, a sermon and for whatever reason, some people decide to bring the children. Because it wasn't planned, some people seem to take offense. Not just some people, his disciples, the ones who were closest to him. Let's read it. Then the children were brought to him, that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people. But Jesus said, let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them. For such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them, and went away. Why at this point did Jesus leave? Was he upset with his disciples' actions? Who knows? I'm just putting the question out there. And then in Luke 18, 35 to 43, we read of another instance where people had tried to stop others from coming to the Lord. And we see the outcome once again. Let's read. As he, that's Jesus, drew near to Jericho, A blind man was sitting by the roadside begging, and hearing a crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. And they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who were in front rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped And commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, What do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, Recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. Instead of rebuking the man and telling him to be quiet, they should have been the ones crying out, Jesus, over there, there's another one, Jesus, who needs you, while picking the man up and bringing him before the Lord. Sorry, Jesus, there's another one. Jesus, and another one, only you can help. In these verses, we see ordinary people 
People like us, you and me, reacting to a situation in a way we all might do if it happened today. But what we have to be careful of is, are we reacting to a situation because it affects us, or are we reacting to a situation because it affects the Lord? Let me try and explain my thinking. If a wolf came in amongst the sheep, we would drive them out. This kind of thing affects the body of Christ. If someone is spreading gossip, we cut it off. Because bad works, bad words are like gangrene. It spreads through the body. These kind of actions are affecting the body and they need to be stopped ASAP. Stopping someone because they are deemed socially, uh, are not deemed socially acceptable or socially important is not Jesus' style. So I don't think it should be ours. Jesus did not die for this building. He died for the church, which is the body of Christ, not this building. Bricks and mortar can be repaired and replaced, but a human heart is not replaceable once it is lost. There are times when we exclude, but we must never stop being inclusive because there's a great possibility we will stop praise and glory coming to God and we do not want that. Because if Jesus had not stopped in that passage we just read and called the blind man back, what would have happened? People would have not seen the power of God at work. They would have missed his awesome display of his great grace and mercy. And all the people would not have given praise to God, all because someone was not happy with the way things were happening. So let's bring it all together as we close. For God so loved the world, he gave his Son. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God is not an evil tyrant dictating what we can and can't do. He just knows what is best for us. And he knew we could never save ourselves. So he did it for all, for everyone. He made a way back to himself through Jesus. We just have to follow and trust in that way. And just as God's love is inclusive to all, so must we be inclusive to all. Because by doing so, we are showing God's love to the world. The Holy Spirit works in people's hearts to change them, not us. All we have to do is bring them to God's word. Yes, we may be put out of it. Yes, we may have to suffer. But we must never forget how patient the Lord has been with us. Our eyes need to be focused on the cross to remember what Christ has done for us. Jesus never said the road ahead was going to be easy for the Christian, but he did say he will always be there for us. And that he will never leave us or forsake us. So his hand is always there to pick us up when we fall. So our hand needs always to be there to pick people up. Not to push them away, but to lead them to Christ. A few months back, Pastor Rich gave a very challenging sermon from Luke 14 verses 1 to 24. And I would encourage you to listen to that because it's much better than mine. But in that passage, it talks of a great banquet and the master invited some who he thought would come, but they wouldn't. So the master opened the banquet to all who would come. So too must we send out the master's invitation to all. Everyone here today has heard the Master's invitation. How will you respond to his love today? Amen.